Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is our Q&A session with Dr. Samaraju. And before we get started with some introductions, I just wanted to um, start with some housekeeping items. Uh, we do have Spanish language interpretation set up on this call. Um, our Spanish language interpreter is Fran Zamora. Fran, if you want to switch over to the English channel and um, just give a quick introduction and let people know how to switch over to the Spanish channel. Yes, I can hear you, Fran. Are you able to just um, quickly in Spanish give a little introduction to the meeting and let people know how they can switch over to the Spanish language? Thank you. Thank you, Fran. You can go ahead and switch back over to the Spanish and then um, continue interpreting back from there. Just a couple more housekeeping items. We are live streaming the session on our Facebook page. And after we conclude today, the recordings will be available immediately on our Facebook page. And um, tomorrow they will also be available on our YouTube channel. Um, I want to remind everyone that um, the purpose of this meeting is to give some information about COVID-19 and the vaccine and allow people to ask questions about that. Um, so we ask everybody to keep it to serious questions and keep things civil, no profanity, um, no harassing statements or um, debates or anything of that sort. So I'll get started with some introductions and then we'll, um, if Dr. Samaraju give a short presentation for us. So my name is Jessica Turner. I'm the communication specialist for the Rock County Public Health Department. And then also from the Rock County Public Health Department, we have Ann Weirich, public health nurse. So she is available if we get any questions that are specific to the health department. Uh, and as I already mentioned, we have Fran Zamora who will be translating for us in Spanish. And then we have Dr. Samaraju. And Dr. Samaraju uh, is an infectious disease physician at Beloit Health System. She's been practicing at Beloit Health System since June, 2015. She was a clinical professor with extensive administrative, academic, and clinical experience at the UIC campus in Peoria, Illinois. She was elected Senate member at UIC for several years. Her teamwork and collaborative abilities in academia and clinical skills have been recognized through several excellence awards and outstanding teacher awards. In addition, she is a recipient of the UIC University System-Wide Outstanding Teaching Awards, which is only awarded to a few selected faculty members. At Beloit Health Systems, as Medical Director of the Infectious Diseases Department, Dr. Samaraju has successfully established the Infectious Diseases Service Line in the Beloit community, treating a wide range of, of infectious diseases. She's also Medical Director of the Hospitalist Program and is currently serving as uh, one of the members of our Rock County Public Health Department uh, Board of Health. So with that, Dr. Samaraju, um, we will put your slides up on the screen. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Yes. You can go right ahead with. All right. OK, so you want to move on to the next slide? Can you hear, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, so I just would like to give a little brief introduction of COVID-19. What is COVID-19? just to give us the story, how it started and where we are now. So COVID-19 
the, to define COVID-19, this coronavirus disease, since it started in 2019, so it's called COVID-19. It's like a small flower-like with all the petals. So the, the, the word corona comes from its structure. There are different kinds of viruses, RNA viruses and DNA viruses. This is an RNA virus. And coronavirus is found in so many different species. You have it in bats, you have it in, uh, in mammals, cats, camels, you, na you name an animal, it's there, including human beings. So we have a lot of different species of coronaviruses all across the uh, living uh, creatures, I would call it. Next slide. Okay, so this is a brief um, COVID timeline, when it started and how it was announced as a pandemic. And then after the pandemic, we all know what is happening. So it started in actually December, 2019 in Wuhan province of China. But by the time we came to know, the world came to know it was in January. And by uh, February 26, we, we confirmed the first case, CDC confirmed the first case. Then by 6th of February, we had first COVID related death. And March 11th, the WHO World Health Organization announced it as a pandemic. Then we know the story how we spiked with the first wave and how many deaths. And by May 1st, I think we had fully established a pandemic all across the um, nation. Uh, in, uh, in, that, in addition to that, I think several countries in the world. Next slide. So what is the current status of pandemic in uh, USA? This is as of 8.22, just a few days ago. And actually, I have a little number noted. Um, I will talk about it a little later. So, so we have world and USA. Total cases so far are 212 million cases of COVID infections all across the world. And we have 4 million, almost close to 4 million and 500 deaths because of COVID infections. In the USA, we have 38 million, and so far almost close to 650,000 deaths. And how many are fully vaccinated in USA? And the numbers from today is, as of today, it is 171 million, 171.4 million people are vacc fully vaccinated. And how many, how many doses were given so far? 363,915,792 doses were given. So if you look at this, only 52 to 53% of people are fully vaccinated. And if you compare this with the world, it's only 24.4% of world population is fully vaccinated. This is as of 8.22. Next slide. Now, there is always questions come up, why this coronavirus came? What was its structure? Why it is changing its characters? Why are we having this Delta variant? And what is the problem with the Delta variant? Why this young 15, 20, 35 year old are getting uh, sick with COVID infections? So, so to understand the COVID virus, let's talk about a simple way with a, in a little pearl necklace. So the, the white pearls with all the white pearls, that is the original COVID-19 virus. All the, each bead, we call it as a sequence. So each bead is purely everything same, there is nothing different. All of that is called original COVID-19 that is represented as a white pearl chain. And in the middle, you see all these coronavirus structures 
and if you can see it well or not, in the third, uh, third uh, uh, cartoon, you find some red spots on that. So that is represented in your mutations. In the first, on the leftmost chain, you have white and also red beads. So this could be a first mutation we saw like, two, like so three, three or six months ago. Then you have more mutations. You have the original beads, but you got now green and red beads. Now the sequencing, the genetic sequencing of the virus changes. Now that change is called mutation. So this is a simple way of representing fully white beads is your original one. Then you had only one red bead. Then you have one red and the green bead. Still you have original white bead. So mutations are happening. These mutations would happen as long as virus is circulating in the population. Next slide. Now I jumped from the, I did not go into details of the symptoms of COVID and all that by now, I think everyone is pretty much similar, uh, familiar with the COVID uh, infection, how it uh, represents or presents to the, to the hospitals or people even that don't have to go through the um, hospitalization, they will get minor infection and they recover. So, the, all, the, all the questions around this uh, presentation is about the vaccines, why we should take vaccines, why we should not take vaccines. So I'm focusing more on the vaccination. So traditionally, if we have to come up with a vaccine, any vaccine, you name it, like you know, polio, diphtheria, tetanus, whatever the infections we had all these years. So we, there is a protocol, that protocol has several steps. A vaccine development can go from five to 15 years, dep depending upon the complex complexity of the vaccine and how it is prepared, what, uh, where it is prepared. There's so many things we have to take into consideration. So the first step in any COVID vaccine or any development of vaccine is clinical trials, which we call it as phase one. Then we go a little higher step, the phase two, then the clinical trial phase three. Then we have to go through a regulatory process like the FDA. They have to go through several weeks or months, sometimes years. Then finally it goes to the manufacturing and the where they can start producing the vaccine. So there are several steps involved. Whereas in COVID, we didn't have that luxury of five years or 15 years because people were dying from the infection. So all the processes started at the same time. As you see here, the manufacturing started in the phase three of the trials because they felt first and second phases were successful. At the beginning of the third phase, they were still doing the clinical trials. They, were, they started the regulatory process and also manufacturing process. Here, no step was missed. And actually, as a human being, we have to appreciate the science behind this, how quickly and how successfully the, the scientific world or the researchers came up with a vaccine without missing any steps. So within one year of this COVID infection, we got the vaccine. So next slide. So now there are two different types of vaccinations. COVID-19 as mRNA, we have two of them, Pfizer and Moderna, and a vector vaccine in Johnson and Johnson. Now, what is this mRNA vaccine? mRNA vaccines are nothing but they, it is a relatively new technology, but believe it or not, this technology was used in the past for several other uh, reasons in the scientific world. But first time they made vaccine vaccinations with mRNA. Basically, we take the uh, piece of genetic material is used, and the genetic material would have all the coding. So these viruses work with coding, coding of certain proteins of the structure. And they code, and that genetic material is used for the vaccination and 
your immune system, you respond to this genetic information put in you, then you, your immune system responds and comes up with the antibodies to certain parts of the virus that will attach your cells, which is taking an access into you, it blocks all those sites. That, that way you are building up antibodies not to get an infection. So that is mRNA vaccine. We have two of them in the US. Then we have the vector vaccine. This is a little bit older technology where they use an inactive virus. Here they're using a virus called as adenovirus 26. They use that, but still they use the genetic material instead of directly giving it, they are using this um, adenovirus as a vehicle and a transporter to get into the uh, immune system or into the uh, vaccine so that your immune system gets stimulated and releases the antibodies to help you, pro help, help you protect from the infection. The final goal of these two vaccines is same formation of antibodies against the coronavirus. It's like, you know, you go to Chicago, you're going to downtown Chicago is your goal. You can go in 15 different ways or only two different ways. So here we are reaching our goal in two different ways. That is the only difference. Otherwise their function, how they stimulate your immune system is the same. Next slide. So there are a lot of questions come up. What is, what is there in, the, in these vaccination, vaccinations? What is actually put in these vaccinations? Is that safe for the human being or not? So there are so many chemicals or so many, I would say, are used. Before we go into that detail, I want to just give you overall how good or how bad are these vaccines. So Moderna vaccine, if you take two doses, four weeks apart, you have a 94 to 95% effective. That means this is not 100% protection. You have 94 to 95% protection from this Moderna vaccine. And it is uh, authorized for anybody who is 18 years and older. And the Pfizer, again, mRNA vaccine, it is given 21 days apart. It's almost 95%. So my Moderna or the Pfizer, they are equally effective. And the Pfizer is given uh, 16 years and above, but it needs a lot of storage and shipping, extreme cold and storage protocols are there. But these both vaccines are very comparable. There is no uh, difference in their production or technology and the way they are going to help you. And whereas the vector vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson, it has a different technology. It, it gives you up to 72%. They, it can vary from country to country. In USA, it's up to 72% of effectiveness after you are fully vaccinated. That means 28 days after your shot, you are, uh, you are uh, you know, considered fully vaccine, vaccine uh, you can get the protection and it does not need extreme temperatures for the cold in you. As you see, it is 36 to 46 degree Fahrenheit. So that is where is the difference between these three vaccines. And no live viruses used in any of these vaccines. They tested in 30 to 43. And actually in some research papers, it's up to 50,000 50, people were tested by these vaccines before they brought this into the public. And after you take the vaccine, you may get some symptoms. Actually getting those symptoms is important because your immune system is reacting. You may get aches and pains, couple of days of fevers, headache, you get like a flu-like symptoms. Sometimes people get a little lymph node like gland enlargement in the, in the armpits or in the neck, but all that will disappear in three to four days. So these are common uh, expected side effects, or I would not say side effects, I would say the symptoms related to the vaccine. Next slide. Now these are the questions, some questions uh, which are frequently asked. So I brought some of these questions. 
why should we trust the COVID-19 vaccine? So it is, it went through all the steps for any vaccine, but went through quickly because I would actually, uh, should be a proud that, you know, we came up with this effective vaccine in one year. The vaccine could take up to five to 15 years for others, but the scientific world came together and came up with this protocol of going through all the steps, just like any other vaccine and getting out to the public in one year time. So there are some agencies who are experts in this vaccine. They have no conflict of interest. They go through vigorous testing, vigorous protocols. So they're they come up with, yes, this will work. No, this is not work. There is no conflict of interest. So whatever vaccines we have, they went through all this vaccine related biological product advisory committee, as well as ACIP, that is advisory committee on immunization practices. And that advises actually to the CDC. So we did not miss anything in coming up with these vaccines. Next slide. Now, there was a question I know I frequently get, what is this, what is an EUA? And what does that mean for a person or for, you know, for you as a person who is going to take vaccine? So EUA is emergency authorization. That means because we are in a situation of pandemic where people are impacted significantly, so death toll is increasing. So they do this emergency authorization. It's not fully uh, FDA protocol gone through, but they have enough data to say that this is a safe and effective. So they go through this again, as I said, the agencies involved have no conflict of interest. They just are the neutral people who recommend this. So EUA is a uh, emergency process in a situation of pandemic where you want to save the lives of people, that's where the EUA, EUA comes into picture. Next slide. Next slide. How was the vaccine developed so quickly? As I said, you know, we should be proud as a human being how we could come up with this vaccine so quickly in one year with all the entire world collaborating and entire world's scientific uh, uh, scientists working on this, I think uh, David, as I said again and again, we did not miss any step, steps in bringing these vaccines. Next slide, next slide. So now I think I'm giving you a little more details about where this was used, who were involved in vaccine trials, what was the ethnic population, and you can see for the Pfizer and Moderna, number of people enrolled both one in Moderna was 25,000 and over 40,000 for the Pfizer. And race and ethnicity of participants, like 30% racially diverse, 10% black and 13% Hispanic. And the adults, 45, so 56 to 85, there's a big range of age. And similarly, you can see the racial distribution, 37% diverse and 10% Black, 20% Hispanic and Latino, and 23% with more than 65 years of old. So they are, if the trials, all these phase one, two, three trials went through vigorous testing uh, before they brought these vaccines out. Next slide. And the overall efficacy, as I said earlier, both of them almost same, 95%. Next slide. And actually the efficacy uh, was same in more or less every um, race or eth ethnical background. Now this is all the chemicals used. It's a detailed slide. So you can look at it. So there are so many ingredients used here and you know where these ingredients are used outside the vaccines, and you can go into detail. This is a lot of you know chemical chemistry words here. But one thing I can say that these these things 
the ingredients used in these vaccines are relatively safe. I would not say these are 100% safe, depending upon the patient's allergic reactions, depend upon their allergic background and whatever their immune system status is. So, but these are relatively safe products. And again, as I said, vaccine does not contain any preservatives, no animal products, no latex, milk or lactose or egg or any maize or peanut, all those products are not there um, in these ingredients. Next slide. Next slide. So these are the selected, um, some of the important side effects which are registered. Uh, these are called the, the, the agency which keeps a track of all that. So there is selected adverse event reported after COVID-19 vaccination. This is as of August 16th. There were uh, two to five anaphylaxis. That anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction. So only two to five per million vaccinated. So we got so many millions vac vaccinated. So if you put together, the benefit of the vaccine is so much compared to the people who had anaphylaxis. And most of the times they may you know, recover from the, um, uh, the allergic reaction. The other thing which was uh, now well uh, came out in the public and also in the media was thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. This is nothing but the clotting syndrome and it's called TTS. This was seen with Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So far, as of August 16, 42 out of 13 million doses given. So again, the benefit is so much out of these vaccines than the 42 cases of thrombosis or the blood clotting issues they had. Again, there are uh, people who were less than 50 years and only few cases were documented. And the Moderna had only two out of 339 million doses given. Again, the benefit is so much compared to whatever we, uh, we see it as a side effect with the, with the blood clotting. The other syndrome called as Guillain-Barre syndrome, this is nothing but a, a neuritis, ne like a leg weakness, neuropathy type of thing, a, like a neurologically some impairment. And it is seen out of 161 out of 13 million doses of Johnson & Johnson. It's not seen uh, much with the other two vaccines, the mRNA vaccines. And recently there was more talk about inflammation around the heart, pericarditis and the myocarditis, inflammation around the heart, around 1300 was seen with Pfizer and Moderna. And most of them, uh, whatever I read, recovered without any uh, long-term uh, sequelae. And so far, the deaths about the COVID vaccine, they were 600, sorry, 6,700 close to of 800, 6,800 COVID deaths. So far, more than 303 million, 357 million doses were given. So again, the percentage is 0.0019%. Again, you see, when you look at the 6,000, wow, 6,000 deaths, but these deaths are just reported. People are still reviewing. And what happened to these individuals? Is there something else going on? So we have to look at their death certificates. What actually caused their death? Is it related to the vaccine? Is it something else was happening to them? This is a, whether this is a coincidental finding and that data, I think they're still working on that. You know, my gut feeling is when they review in depth, after in depth review, we may not come up with this number. Maybe the number will be smaller than what we are seeing. At this point, this is what is quoted um, as of August 16th. Next slide. So vaccine associated enhanced respiratory disease. This is another common thing which a lot of um, you know, uh, individuals may have this. This is a rare, rare, uh, uh, I would say side effect of the vaccines, especially COVID vaccines. 
So this is commonly called as enhanced disease, but there is a big name for it medically. And vaccine, the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, you took it for, to help you, your immune, res, your immune system to respond and give you antibodies to uh, protect you from COVID. So here, the vaccine induces an immune response that causes the disease the vaccine is supposed to protect us. When this would happen only if somebody is exposed to the virus. For example, if you take, took a COVID vaccine today, like a seven or eight days later, which is COVID vaccine takes up to two weeks to give you some protection, you got exposed to the virus and that instead of COVID vaccine helping you, is you have the vaccine in your system and you got exposed to the virus, if the combination of that, it's a rare event, can actually make your COVID infection worse. That is called enhanced lung disease and patients can come with and they will give you a story. I took the vaccine like a week ago. Now, then I started having this. Then what happened in between? Yes, my, my uh, mother or my sister was uh, tested positive at uh, three days after I took vaccine, but the sister or mother who are living with them. So when they took the vaccine, they did not have symptoms, but they got exposed. And again, as I said, this is a very rare event. And I'm not sure how many even documented so far, but this is a very rare event. Next slide. And the uh, facts about COVID vaccine, and they cannot give you, give somebody COVID-19. So you are not taking any live virus. You're not giving any infection to anyone. They do not affect or interact with your DNA. When we say mRNA, this nucleic or genetic material, people think that there may be issues with your own uh, genetic material but no, the, the genetic material used is so small, soon after it is given into your system, it breaks up after the using the instructions, there is no DNA or nothing happens, it's gone from your immune system. And fully vaccinated means one to two weeks after the complete vaccine, completion of vaccine doses. If you are taking Pfizer, that means after you take two doses, a week or two later, you're defined as fully vaccinated. Then the question comes, how long this is going to protect you? It's about six to eight months. Initially, they thought maybe no less, but I think it's giving us six to eight months. That's why now CDC released just a week ago, the booster shots. So, so people are waiting with their immune system. So they wanted the immune suppressed patients who are older and all patients who are kidney transplant or any type of immunocompromised patients to get their boosters first. So that's why we just started the booster courses. Next slide. Okay, now the question comes, why this Delta variant is making so much uh, publicity in the media? So Delta variant is more contagious. I put two figures there. There, there is the, the original COVID-19. If you have the infection, you can infect on about two people. And if you have Delta variant, you can infect six people. So the infectivity, the, when you sneeze or cough, you're infecting more people, it's more contagious. Uh, so Delta variant is more contagious. And interestingly, if you are fully vaccinated, the Delta variant will give you mild symptoms. If you remember the first few slides, the vaccines are not 100%, they're only 95%. So there is a risk of the breakthrough infections, but if you are fully vaccinated, these breakthrough infections are very, very mild. You can get it over, and sometimes even you may not even know that the, uh, the breakthrough infection was a COVID infection. But one thing we have to keep in the mind, let's take you have a family member, like five, five six family members only took, 
two people took vaccination and four did not take. So if you are not, if you are fully vaccinated, if you are not wearing a uh, mask, but you got a breakthrough infection, a breakthrough infection means infection after you got fully vaccinated. So then you have other two family members who are actually having bad symptoms. So you have mild symptoms, other two family members have uh, severe symptoms. So they tested both of them, both the um, vaccinated and unvaccinated. When they you know, put those vaccine, uh, sorry, the swabs in their nose and pull the swabs and tested how much virus is there in these vaccinated and unvaccinated. Interestingly, the virus, amount of virus in vaccinated, fully vaccinated and unvaccinated, the amount of virus, let's take 100 virus, both had same virus load, but one is not having any symptoms and other one is having severe symptoms. The only difference is the one with minor symptoms took COVID vaccine, but the COVID vaccinated people, as I said, it's only 95% effective. 5%, you can still have an infection, mild infection. If you are not wearing masks and if you are moving around unvaccinated people, you could actually give the infection to the unvaccinated people. And this is the this is the this was study. This study was done in Massachusetts after July 4th weekend. They had a massive outbreak there. And after that study results, I think just two or two weeks ago or three weeks ago, CDC said everyone, irrespective of vaccine or unvaccinated, you should wear the mask, especially indoors, if you feel that there is a bigger crowd that you need to wear a mask. So the rule came after a few weeks of no mask for vaccinated, the rule came because of the amount of virus we have, same in both vaccinated and unvaccinated people. Next slide. Now, these are the questions we were talking about. Uh, okay, all these questions are valid questions, but none of these questions have, have any weight because the vaccines are proven to be much more successful, especially the mRNA vaccines are successful. And actually scientific world is very uh, surprised the way they are behaving, the way it is helping the, uh, the entire world. Next slide. Any questions for me? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Samaraju. We appreciate thank your you. presentation. Um, we'll thank check you. and see if there are any questions in just a second here. Um, I just want to say we're always very grateful for your willingness to share your expertise with us. You are very knowledgeable and we appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, we have a couple of ways that people can ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, if you're on the Zoom call, you can use the Q&A function to type in your question. Um, we will be monitoring that. Or you can use the raise hand function and we will allow you to unmute and ask your question. Um, if you are joining us via phone, in order to use this function, you dial star nine and that will raise your hand and then star six will unmute you once we give you the ability to do so. Um, we are also monitoring the Facebook live stream. So if you are watching us on the live stream and you have a question, you can go ahead and type it into the comment section and we will try to incorporate that also. So I will go and see if we have anything that's been submitted so far. I'll give everybody just a, just a minute here to submit their questions if they have any. I think everyone got convinced that they need to take a vaccine now. <laughs> I think so. I think you gave them all the information they needed. <laughs> oh, wait, just another moment. I don't see anything yet. just want to share with you, Dr. Samaraju, we did have one comment on the Facebook live stream um, from Lindsay. She said, thank you, Dr. Samaraju. Great information. We don't always hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let 
Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, if you do think of any questions after the fact, or if you're watching our recording later, you can always submit questions um, to the public health department or to Dr. Samaraju um, using our email address, covid19.questions at co.rock.wi.us. And remember to follow us on our Facebook and our Instagram page. We do update our information on there and share information with you on a very regular basis. So um, that's a great way to get information from the public health department. Okay. So we will, yep. Do you have anything else you'd like to say, Dr. Samaraju? No, thanks for giving me this. And I would uh, love to do it. Any questions, if they have, and uh, you can forward those questions. I can help you guys out. And I appreciate for whatever the time you gave me to express myself. Great. Yeah, thank you. And we really appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Welcome. You're welcome. Okay. So we'll conclude now for everyone who's watching. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Be healthy and be safe. Then I want to see next one week, the Rock County vaccination should go up. <laughs> yes, you heard it from Dr. Samaraja. We want to see you all get vaccinated. All right. Thank we'll... you very much. Thank you. I'm done. Yes, thank you. Thank you.